Sometime in the 6th or 5th century BCE, a man commonly known as Siddhartha Gautama is said to have been born, the son of high-class nobles akin to royalty in the Shakya clan of what is now Nepal. Little can be known or confirmed about his life since it occurred so long ago. What we do know is taken from traditions passed down over the ages and the scriptures his students left behind. At the age of 30, Siddhartha became dissatisfied with his life, having become acquainted with the reality of suffering, illness, and eventual death. Despite having a wife with a son on the way, he decided to renounce his life as a householder and become a wandering monk. After some time wandering, learning from others, never quite finding an answer to the big questions that he liked, Siddhartha proclaimed, he would sit beneath a tree in a place known as Bodhgaya, and would remain there meditating until enlightenment came to him. It finally did. It came as the understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the foundation of all Buddhist schools of thought. These truths were four realizations about the nature of life and the universe that explained why things are the way they are. They are in order, Dukkha, Samudaya, Nirodha, and Marga. These are the terms as they're known in the oldest written Buddhist texts, the Pali Canon. The first is Dukkha, often translated into English as suffering, but might also be understood as dissatisfaction or unease. It comes from the word dushta, standing unstable, and is an innate element of our lives in samsara, the cycle of birth, death, reincarnation, and rebirth that Buddhists believe we all live in. Dukkha is the fact that life is not perfect. We could always want more. It's heavily associated with desire, specifically what we would term selfish desire, wanting things for ourselves and not having them, specifically sensual pleasures, a longer life, or to not exist at all. And it's the not being able to have these things which causes the suffering or dissatisfaction we feel. The second truth is samudaya. It means origin arising or cause. The idea is that dukkha does not exist on its own. It arises alongside tanha, which means craving or attachment. We feel dissatisfaction because we are craving something we do not have, something we don't necessarily need, or would even benefit from. This creates a cycle of craving, not having, and suffering, and this cycle is referred to as patika samupada, or dependent arising. Because this, there's that. The phrase in Sanskrit is asmin sati idam bhavati. There being this, there is that. This cycle, in which we want things, we do things to obtain things, we fail to obtain them, or we obtain them and are disappointed by them, and we suffer and begin craving again, that's the source of all life's problems. The third truth is nirodha, cessation or ending. The truth is, this suffering can end by escaping the craving that leads us to desire things we can't or don't have. The ultimate reason we don't, the cause of the suffering, is our avidya, our ignorance or delusion. We don't recognize the cycle we're trapped in. We falsely believe obtaining objects and chasing desires will make us happy. This ignorance is the root of the cycle of suffering. The fourth truth is marga, which means path and refers to the noble eightfold path. This is the way of living that can help us escape from dukkha and tanha. The path in full refers to living by the right way of things in eight steps. Right views, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. They go in order. You start by learning the Buddhist viewpoint and then develop the right intentions to better yourself. Then you perform the proper manner of speech and behavior, and so on. Three forms of training are required to better yourself on this path. First, you begin with sila, or moral conduct. Minding your behavior, your thoughts and feelings, and treating others well is the start of the road. 
From there, you must develop your samadhi, or mental strength, your control of mind, which will help control your impulses, emotions, and actions. The last step is developing pana, or insight, or wisdom. In this case, it refers to a higher state of meditation and mental control that reveals the reality of our existence, its cycles, and its flaws. This eightfold path and the three forms of training would lead you to live a life free of the selfish suffering that comes from tanha and dukkha, and eventually you could escape the karmic cycle of life and rebirth. You would root out the three poisons, which are greed, hatred, and ignorance. Finally, you would enter nirvana. Here is where Buddhism gets tricky. What is nirvana? It depends on who you ask, because not every Buddhist school says it's the same thing. The Sanskrit word is said to mean past beyond sorrow or beyond ignorance. It's also said to refer to the blowing out of the flame of craving. However it's defined, nirvana is the ultimate goal of all Buddhist traditions. For 45 years, the Buddha spread his teachings and gained quite the following before passing away in his 80s. In the years that followed, what had once been a purely oral tradition began to be systematically categorized and written down. There were now countless monks and monasteries spread across India and Nepal, and the ever-growing faith needed a concrete scripture and solid set of rules to keep order. This is when things started to split as different opinions of how to interpret the texts came about. They wouldn't grow to huge divisions for some time, but over the centuries, three major strands of Buddhism would evolve and spread across the globe, each with their own version and interpretation of the texts. The three strands are known as Theravada Buddhism, which is dominant in Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia, Mahayana Buddhism, which is widespread in China, Vietnam, South Korea, Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, Nepal, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Bhutan, and Vajrayana Buddhism, which is widespread in Tibet, Bhutan, Mongolia, and Nepal. The central Buddhist tenets of the Four Truths and Eightfold Path are all central to these traditions and their many offshoots, but they all differ heavily in their metaphysical ideas. What is nirvana? What happens after death? What is reality? And what is God? Theravada Buddhism holds that nirvana is extinction. Once a person escapes the cycle of reincarnation, there is no eternal life or spiritual existence awaiting them. Nirvana is becoming one with nothing, which is everything. It's ceasing to have existence or consciousness of any kind. Theravada, on the whole, is a more logical, world-focused tradition, centered on personal experience and meditation, with less focus on the transcendental or spiritual elements. Mahayana Buddhism was a development that began in India and China and slowly came to fruition over a few centuries, as various writers and commentators addressed and reinterpreted the scriptures. Mahayana would be a far more metaphysical, philosophical school, which would step away from the logical, almost scientific roots of earlier traditions. As a religion, Theravada has some weaknesses. Its focus is on personal experience, and it requires a person to actually become a monk to enter enlightenment, which restricts how many people can personally be saved by the religion. Since it denies the existence of a life after death and downplays spiritual elements, it doesn't appeal to cultures where such traditions already exist. For those cultures, Mahayana would better serve, offering an interpretation of Buddhism that fit their worldview. The early writers of what would become Mahayana scripture would define Nirvana by not defining it. To them, Nirvana was ultimate reality, the transcendental principle. It is completely beyond human comprehension. It is outside human experience, so how can we define it with words? Instead, it's often defined as what it's not, or as the sum total of all that exists. Mahayana admitted to a transcendental principle, but not an eternal one. In fact, they do the opposite. In his earliest teachings, the Buddha teaches that the central way to stop craving is to realize that you a personal self 
does not really exist. It's a concept called anatta, or no-self, and it was a direct confrontation with popular ideas during the Buddhist time that there was an eternal, unchanging self at the heart of each person. By comparison, the Buddha argued there's no such thing. If you examine yourself, you can't find you anywhere. Where are you? Are you inside your head, your arms? Are you your feelings or your memory? Aren't you all of these things? Truthfully, you as a person are an ever-changing stream of consciousness, like a river running to the sea, and that constant changing element means there can't be an eternal you, because eternity doesn't change. But the Buddha was not arguing there's no soul, just that there is no eternal soul. In Western terms, the Buddhist soul is best thought of as a kind of flame, passing from candle to candle. The same flame lights every candle, but once they're separated, are they really still the same flame? We change. The constant change means that we as people don't really exist as concrete existences. And once we recognize that, we become less attached to ourselves and our supposed identity. We begin to better empathize with others around us. Mahayana Buddhism would take this idea of anatta much further. You can break a person down into component parts and argue that person is really a conceptual label put on a group of aggregates. Mahayana Buddhism argues the same is true of everything. Nothing is actually real in an eternal, unchanging sense. Everything is a conceptual group of elements. Consider a chair. What is a chair? Is it the legs? If a chair has only three legs, or two, is it still a chair? Is the chair in the arms, or in the back? It's all the pieces together. Without them, we really can't call it a chair. It is ultimately a social construct, an idea we created and all agreed upon as reality, but it's only real in that it is conceptual. It is not an eternal thing. In Mahayana Buddhism, a thing is ultimately real if it can stand on its own, if you can divide it into pieces, it's not real. It's an amalgamation of concepts. Those pieces, too, are conceptual and divisive, all the way down to what is ultimately truly real. Nothing. Emptiness. The concept is called sunyata, the idea that everything is ultimately empty of solid, concrete existence. Everything is conceptual and lacking eternity, meaning one day, it will no longer physically exist. In Mahayana Buddhism, our suffering comes from false belief, from ignorance, because we look at the world and things look real. They look eternal, even though they're not. The central differences between Mahayana and Theravada come from this understanding of suffering. Theravada sees it as coming from false perceptions and wrong behaviors on a personal level, and moral and mental training will work to fix it. Mahayana takes this a step further, adding to the moral and mental training a metaphysical understanding of the universe that's required to reach enlightenment. Mahayana adds another feature to its tradition, one that answers the problem of saving enough people. After all, not everyone can become a monk. In fact, monks rely on the common people to survive. They live off the alms and donations they receive. And in the past, the very monasteries they lived in were donated to them by rich merchants and kings. If everyone left everyday life behind to become a monk, no one would be left to help the monks survive. Mahayana would introduce a new kind of Buddha who would be capable of saving everyone, even those who weren't monks the Bodhisattva. In Theravada traditions, you must save yourself. There is no entering Nirvana because of belief or salvation. Mahayana Buddhism would be the opposite. Belief in a Buddha would be enough to save you. A Bodhisattva is a person who is capable of becoming a Buddha, who has trained and studied and become enlightened, but does not enter Nirvana. They remain in the cycle of samsara to save all those left behind. How that's done varies by the various schools involved. Some traditions believe in a concept called the pure land, a kind of heaven dimension created and maintained by a bodhisattva. 
A mortal person can live as a believer in the Bodhisattva without obtaining enlightenment, and find rebirth in this pure land. It might not be nirvana, but it is outside the world of suffering and physical rebirth. Mahayana spread widely due to how accessible it was to the average person who could never be a monk, and eventually it spread and evolved as it came into contact with other traditions, particularly the Tantric Yoga schools and the Bon tradition of Tibet. Tantric Yoga is as old as Buddhism, and it's not a faith in and of itself. It's a kind of religious practice, one that Hindus and Jains and many other faiths from this region of the world have used to train for centuries. Tantra involves incredibly ritualized and intense performances, the overcoming of taboos and the forbidden, heavy usage of symbolism and mental training, and of course, yoga. The Bon tradition of Tibet is a native religion of the region, a shamanistic, ritualistic tradition which accepted and blended over time with Buddhism into a unique flavor that is one of the most widely known Buddhist schools, despite being one of the smallest. This is the tradition of the Dalai Lama and his followers. It blends the Mahayana ideas and concepts with tantric rituals, the Bon religion, and local traditions to create a school of thought that is incredibly detailed and, until quite recently, secretive. Unlike many other Buddhist traditions, Tibetan schools kept their teachings a secret that was passed from guru, or teacher, to the initiate in a long line of lineage said to trace back to the Buddha himself. After China's invasion of Tibet and the scattering of the Tibetan schools, the desire to keep their traditions alive led many Buddhists to begin sharing, teaching, and writing down the old secret traditions. These three schools are the biggest divisions of Buddhism today, with widely different beliefs and traditions among them. But all three are incredibly old and incredibly beautiful, and they all had a hand in the development of the story and world of Final Fantasy X. The faith of the world of Spira derives from a single person, a human being who once lived in a time long past, Yevon. While the man's full name, Yu Yevon, isn't known to the populace, it seems clear from how people and priests talk about him that he's not understood as a god or divine creator, but as a person who taught something. He's regarded in much the same way as the Theravadan Buddha is, a formerly living human whose teachings lead the way to salvation. The salvation here is salvation from sin, a creature who kills without conscious thought, who can die and be reborn again and again. Sin easily correlates to cycles of Buddhist tradition, samsara, the cycle of rebirth, patika samupada, the cycle of desire that keeps us trapped, Buddhism is all about escaping cycles and spirals. This spiral of death is caused because of people's actions. Sin originates in the summoners of Xanarkand, who created it as a weapon but could not control it. It destroys them, just as our own selfish actions are destructive towards ourselves in samsara. It continues to be reborn because of people's ignorance actions, because summoners who do not understand what sin is perform a ritual that recreates it. Ignorance and selfishness are the roots of sin. Sin is also tied to Dream Xanarkand, itself a very Buddhist concept, an existence, a kind of life that is itself a dream. To Buddhism, all life is a dream. It is not permanent, it is not eternal, like a dream, it will end, and like a dream, we will all one day be forgotten. The word is often used to describe life in the scriptures, such as, All things from form to omniscience are like illusions and like dreams. In Spira, people can literally be dreams. The teachings of Yevon aren't revealed much in the story, but we know some things for certain. Following the teachings will save people from suffering, 
It involves repentance for past behavior and a change in behavior. It is a primarily moralistic teaching, like the oldest scriptures of Buddhism. The highest priests of the Yevon faith are known as maesters in English. In Japanese, they're referred to as roshi, a term that refers to an elderly teacher, master, or a monk, and is often used to refer to Buddhist priests. More than that, the temples of Yevon themselves are called ebonjin, ebon being the Japanese pronunciation of Yevon, and jin, a word that specifically refers to Buddhist temples or monasteries. These temples are incredibly unique, especially when compared to real-world temples and monasteries, because they serve a very unique function. These temples are places where living people are interred, creating the faith that serves as the source for the summoner's incredible powers. That's the central purpose of the temple, to serve as a location for the summoner's pilgrimage, where they come, perform in the trials, and pray to receive the summon. Before the Buddha died, he is said to have told his followers to create a tradition of pilgrimage to four places from his life, where he was born, where he died, where he received enlightenment, and where he performed his first sermon. Of course, this limited pilgrimage to these places, which wasn't accessible once the tradition spread globally, Instead, a new tradition developed, the creation of holy places by interring the bones, ashes, or belongings of a Buddha or Bodhisattva in a spherical building known as a stupa or pagoda. These weren't just buildings that held old bones. Various traditions had incredibly detailed ceremonies to inter these remains, which embodied them with the actual spirit of the Buddha, creating a sacred space by entrapping the Buddha's presence within the remains or the stone they were contained in. Regardless of the actual relic itself, whether it was a piece of the person's body or a belonging from their lifetime, the object was treated as if it was the living Buddha and was consecrated as something sacred. According to Buddhist tradition, the potency of stupas and their power to bestow blessings was said to derive from the presence of the living Buddha within them. The Tibetan ritual for such a thing is incredibly involved. The monk who performs the ritual must first purify themselves by imagining themselves as a sacred Buddha or deity, a practice called deity yoga. As they do so, they purify the object of veneration through dispelling negative forces and physically bathing it if it is a statue. Then they enter the object or remains into the final resting place. They begin praying and repeating mantras, a type of sacred, powerful repetition of words. In this case, the words would be, Naturally pure are all phenomena. Naturally pure am I. The object would thus become one with sunyata, emptiness, and would embody the spirit of the Buddha to whom it belonged. To further entrap the Buddha, gestures of invitation and entrapment would be performed. Mudras, which are hand signs that have power and meaning. A set of various mudras are performed to summon the Buddha to the stone, and a final initiation is done to seal the stone. Then offerings are given, and the ritual enthronement finishes the performance. The language and rituals involved in such sacred objects, and the concept of the stupa itself, is incredibly similar to the faith. A spirit trapped in a stone, entombed in a sacred place, and given prayers and offerings in return for protection and power. These faith also clearly contain actual bodies of the people who were involved. Each stone has a person posed within it, physically sealed in the manner of a Buddha's remains. The land around these temples is changed by their presence, Ixion's lightning creates the Thunder Plains, Shiva's ice freezes Makalanya Lake. In the same way that the Buddha's stupas are considered holy land, changed land, because of the presence of the Buddha within. These stupas were traditionally round, though they developed incredible detail and variation over time. The round shape was meant to symbolize the universe, which is visualized in Buddhism as a great sphere, at the center of which is a holy mountain, Mount Meru or Sumeru. 
Every spear and temple is spherical, and the temples themselves resemble the design of many Buddhist temples, in particular those of Thailand and Burma in the south. And the tradition of a holy mountain seems very similar to the importance given to Mount Gagazet. Inside Sin, the final section that leads to the end of the game, is a place called the Tower of the Dead. It's actually seen a few times before the end, specifically during Operation Mihen when dead spirits are seen wandering within. In Japanese, the tower is called Shisha no To, and the term that's used for tower is also used to refer to pagodas or stupas, making this a holy, sacred place inside Sin, a correlation to all the stupas of the faith across Spira. This is where Jekt is entombed. More than just the temples and priests involve references to Buddhism, many of the enemies do as well. Some fiends are named for Buddhist creatures and concepts. This isn't unique to Final Fantasy X, as it's a tradition Final Fantasy has indulged in for years. There's the Gandharewa, which in Japanese is called Gandharva, a word that refers to a classification of deva, or deity, in Buddhism. There's the Bashura, called Ashura in Japanese, referring to a fierce multi-armed deva. There's Varuna, the Hindu name for a Buddhist god known as Suiten in Japan, and there are many, many others. But more importantly, Final Fantasy X has a few central creatures with very unique names that imply deeper meaning for the game's story. Late in the game, the player encounters the ancient weapons of the Machina War, the defenders who are now used by the Yevon Church to attack non-believers. In English, this is Defender Z and Defender Y, referring to the type of Machina involved. In Japanese, the title is more specific. Defender Z is Zero Shiki Goho Kishi, or Type Zero Law Defense Mechanism. The symbol for Doctrine Defense, Goho, are two of the three symbols that appear in the word Gohojin, the Japanese term for Dharmapala, the wrathful deities who protect the Buddhist doctrine. Late in the game, the player faces two guardian bosses, the Sanctuary Keeper and Spectral Keeper. Both are, in essence, guardians of the way forward, protecting the entry into Xanarkand and the entry into Unaleska's chambers. The Japanese names for these bosses have greater meaning for these locations, however. The Sanctuary Keeper is called Seichi no Gaidian, using the Kaakana alphabet to spell out the English word guardian in Japanese. Seichi is a word meaning holy land in a general sense, but it's also used to refer specifically to locations that are part of pilgrimages, including the Buddhist sites of pilgrimage in India, China, and Japan. The Spectral Keeper is Matan no Gaidian, essentially meaning guardian of the demon heaven. What's important to understand about the word demon in Japanese, ma, is that it actually originates in Buddhist tradition. The demon Mara is said by many Buddhists to have been the tempter who tried to divert the Buddha from his path. He often appears in scripture and folk tales as a diversion to lead the holy person astray, and his name, Mara, is later borrowed to refer to any kind of demonic creature in Japanese, Ma. In this case, Ma-ten refers to a specific place. Ten is the Japanese for heaven, Ma for demon, thus creating a demon heaven. The symbol for heaven can also be used to refer to the Buddhist concept of devas, or gods. Together, this implies that the space the spectral keeper guards is an evil heaven, or it's home to a demon or false god, which Unaleska is revealed to be. Yevon's traditions involve a lot of the number four. There are four high priests in the tradition, and when you visit the temples, you see four statues representing the four high summoners who have defeated Sin in the past, O'Holland, Gandalf, Braska, and Yosun. In many Buddhist traditions, the number four refers to the four divine kings, four bodhisattvas who represent the universe, the four cardinal directions, the four elements, the four continents of existence, and so forth. Add to the four of them the fifth greatest Buddha, which various traditions align with the different figures, and you have a tradition of four holy figures and a fifth holiest one, 
much like the Four Maesters or the Four High Summoners and Yevon. The statues of the High Summoners aren't the only ones at the temples. If you look around, you'll see many varieties of fierce-looking, strange creatures, often in pairs before doorways or running alongside the walls. In Kilika, you see a great dragon-like beast on the staircase. In Baj, strange lizard-like monsters stand before the door. You see similar fierce faces on some of the fiends, such as the Arog and creatures like it. In Buddhist tradition, there exist creatures known as Yaksha, a term borrowed from Hinduism. These are divine beasts, fierce spirits who act as guardians to the temples. While gentle and protective, they are also monstrous to reflect their dangerous nature, and they might appear as anything from strange-faced monsters holding giant swords to dragons and multi-headed serpents. Other stones involved in temple design include the Sima Stones, or Bai Sema, as they're known in Thai. These are decorative stones placed at specific parts of the temple boundary to demarcate sacred ground, typically with nine in total, four at each corner of the building, four in the center of each wall, and one buried beneath the Buddha itself, at the center of the temple. Beneath each Sima Stone is another round sphere called a Luk Nimit, which is buried there during temple construction. These objects indicate the sacred element of the space and mark the boundaries of it, and many similar stone constructions can be found in and around the central space of Spirin temples, not to mention the Faith Stone itself. The Faith in Japanese are called Inoriko, or Child of Prayer. The word child might imply a youth to the creature, that it was only just born, created from the prayer of others. In Japanese, inori refers to a prayer as a request to a deity or a heartfelt wish, something desired, something wanted. In this case, this heartfelt wish gave birth to a child spirit. These faith are sealed in the chamber of the faith, known in Japanese as the inoriko no ma. Ma is a very important Buddhist belief that is unique to Japanese traditions, particularly Zen. It's a word referring to space or room, which is why it's translated as chamber, but it also has a philosophical, metaphysical meaning. The symbol itself is a combination of two other symbols, the symbol for door and the symbol for sun. The image it brings to mind is a small gap with light shining through. Ma is the space between, the empty space, which is empty because it is full of potential, of meaning, the faith are locked inside a gap, a space of possibility, out of which comes the impossible and unreal dream known as the aeons. Aeon is a word that refers to long periods of time, or simply the energy of life. Either of these seems fitting for dream creatures manifested by the prayers of others. In Japanese, they are simply keramono, literally meaning thing of hair, a creature, or a beast. These strange things aren't real, physical existences. They are the dreams of the faith. These dreams come to life through a combination of behaviors involving the summoner, the entombed faith, and the act of praying. The bond that is created is what makes a summoner a summoner, and it has a lot to do with the Tibetan practice of deity yoga. The Tibetan Buddhist tradition is part of the school of Vajrayana, which is very different from the other schools. Both Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism believe it could take countless lifetimes for a person to become enlightened. Vajrayana Buddhism believes the opposite. With the right training, you could become a Buddha in a single lifetime, and they do it through the practice of deity yoga. The idea stems from the philosophical belief that what will be true must obviously be capable of being true right now. If you could be a Buddha in the future, that obviously means there's a seed, a possibility of Buddhahood inside you already. It's not an impossibility, you just haven't fulfilled it yet. So by meditating on yourself, imagined as the Buddha or God, as someone divine right now, you are fast-tracking yourself to the end goal. It is a complex, intense training method which involves mentally transforming your own understanding of yourself. It does not mean you become God. 
It is bringing down the barriers between you and the divine, recognizing them as empty of reality, and realizing that means there's nothing different between you and the ultimate. You are divine right now, and that brings you closer to Buddhahood. The practice of deity yoga involves intense meditation, recitation, and practice upon a singular deity. There are many traditions of deity yoga that have developed in Tibet. The four central Tibetan schools each have their own variations with their own methods and rituals. One common form is called Charya Yoga, which involves six stages of development towards the divine. These six stages tie into the six stages of a summoner's growth, something which becomes clear the first time you obtain anima. There are only five aeons that must be obtained to defeat the game. There are a few extra, however, and one is anima. To obtain her, you must obtain six treasure chests from the six required dungeons of the game. The five aeons temples and the temple in Xanarkand, where the player would have attained the final aeon if Yuna had followed tradition. That means there are six aeons which are traditionally required to defeat Sin, making the summoner's training one that involves six stages towards divinity. The similarity between these Tibetan traditions and the Spiran ones continue. Because of all the Buddhist schools, the Tibetan is the most secretive. Until recently, the more sacred teachings were kept secret, taught orally, passed down from teacher to student. In Spira, the practice of the summoner is quite secretive. The chamber in which a summoner trains is restricted to the summoner and the guardians who protect them. The priests aren't even allowed in. The faith itself is only available to the summoner. Even guardians cannot be allowed to see within. The ritual that actually makes a summoner capable of summoning is seen only by the summoner and the faith who teaches them, much like a guru and student relationship. It also seems very focused on lineage and oath-keeping. Becoming a summoner means vowing to defeat sin and constantly working towards that goal. It is implied through dialogue and the stories of side characters that summoners who don't finish their pilgrimage or give up are heavily rebuked, are seen essentially as having broken their oath. In the schools of Buddhism that believe in the Bodhisattva, there's the concept of Samaya, the oath. There are many kinds of vows. Some are kept as part of living life as a monk, some as part of following the Buddhist teaching, but there is also the specific vow of the Bodhisattva, in which a person aiming at Buddhahood vows to obtain Nirvana in order to save all beings. In Tibetan tradition, the vow is taken while kneeling before a guru, requesting three times to be given the blessing of the guru, to receive the vow and begin the path towards Buddhahood. If the guru thinks they are worthy, they receive the vow. Making the vow is done publicly, and the person will verbally promise to save all beings from the cycle of samsara. The summoner is a person who has taken a vow to defeat sin, and if they are deemed worthy, will receive the blessing of the aeon. This takes training and preparation, mental fortitude, and morality, all elements of Buddhist teachings and very similar to Tibetan practices and deity yoga. The desire to save Spira has a more general resemblance to the Mahayana concept of Bodhisattva, an enlightened person who remains in the cycle of suffering to save others. A holy person who recognizes the difficulties of achieving Nirvana may choose to train to become a Bodhisattva to achieve Nirvana and remain in the cycle and help others. How that help manifests depends on the Buddhist tradition, but ultimately the Bodhisattva is a holy figure whose life is dedicated to saving others from suffering. This is the exact role of Yuna and summoners like her to save Spira from suffering. This means defeating sin, but also caring for and guiding the people, as Yuna often does. Her interactions with others reveal incredible strength of spirit and moral character, even with other summoners and followers of Yevon. She chose to become a summoner because she wanted to save Spira, and that compassion is what makes her akin to a bodhisattva. Compassion for all sentient beings is the cornerstone of bodhisita, or the mind that cultivates to become a bodhisattva. You must love and care for others in order to wish for an end to their suffering. If you did not care, why would you want to end it? 
The traditional path of bodhisattva compassion moves from the thought of how nice it would be if no one suffered, to the wish that people might not suffer, to the statement, I will myself cause all sentient beings to be free from suffering. This training puts others before yourself. In the words of the Rupaya Ruta, those who are indifferent to their own suffering remove the suffering of others, for they are troubled by the suffering of others, but not the suffering of themselves. The four virtues of the Bodhisattva are Karuna, compassion, Metta, loving kindness, a kind of love that is not romantic or specific, but general and all encompassing, Mudita, sympathetic joy, the kind of happiness that comes from feeling happy for others, and Upeka, equanimity, seeing all people as equal and favoring none. These elements, the things a bodhisattva must embody and the goals they strive for, are all incredibly relevant to Yuna, how she behaves and tries to control herself, the way she projects a smile and kindness to everyone she meets, no matter how she feels, her determination to sacrifice herself in order to save everyone. All of it is incredibly similar to the determination and compassion of the Bodhisattva who sets out to end the cycle of suffering. These things alone aren't enough to succeed, however. In Tibetan belief, it ultimately comes down to the union of two central elements, wisdom and compassion. These are symbolic of greater elements of the universe, and the Bodhisattva must know and understand both as one. Compassion is, as I've said, love for all, desire for all to no longer suffer. The wisdom element is the metaphysical, philosophical one, and it relates to the concept of emptiness. In realizing that nothing is real, that everything is changing, evolving, you recognize nothing is eternal, but neither is nothing really nothing. Buddhism rejects the two extremes of nihilism and eternalism, represented in Final Fantasy X as Seymour, who wants to end all life in Spira, and Unileska, who believes the cycle must be eternal and never-ending. Between the two is the middle path, which Buddhism would become known as, a path that believes people exist, but not eternally. The wisdom to understand what reality is, to see the truth, and the compassion to love all beings and wish for their freedom from suffering, united in a person who has trained body and soul to better themselves, that is a bodhisattva. The word Buddha, after all, means to know, one who knows, or one who is awake. Yuna's journey involves both wisdom and compassion. She begins with compassion, the desire to help. She develops the wisdom, the insight to see to the truth, recognizing the church is covering up Seymour's actions, that they're lying about the origin of sin, giving people false hope. Ultimately, she faces Unileska, her namesake, and turns away from the teachings when she learns they'll never end sin. She gains the wisdom to see reality as it is, to see the truth, and the wisdom plus compassion is what makes her ascend to Buddhahood. It's at this time the player can seek out the celestial weapons, including Yuna's, which is amply called Nirvana. Yuna's journey is the most Buddhist element of all, because it was the Buddha himself that said, once the teachings no longer serve you, you must turn aside from the teachings. Original Buddhism was focused entirely on personal experience. If your experience teaches you otherwise, don't follow the teachings. It was best phrased in The Discourse to the Kalamas, a very old scripture that answers the question of whether one is allowed to question the Buddha. In it, the Buddha himself says, Do not accept a thing by recollection, by tradition, by report, because it is based on the authority of scriptures. When you know for yourselves, these things are unwholesome. When undertaken and performed lead to harm and suffering, these things you should reject. Later traditions would take it further with their idea of emptiness, that nothing has inherent existence, that everything is relative. Well, that means you can't make concrete rules for everything, because it's all relative. In the words of Zen, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. If the teachings no longer assist you, discard them. So, Yuna did.
A major element of Tibetan Buddhism is the mandala, a spherical work of art that represents the entire universe, or in the words of scripture, a round symbol of the universe. It can be created with sand, it can be painted or crafted into a work of art, or it can be mentally imagined by the meditator. The circular design contains letters, symbols, and pictures of the divine that represent all of reality, and meditation upon the mandala and its mental recreation in the meditator's mind brings one closer to God, to the divine. Every single aeon has a unique spherical glyph that represents them, and that appears whenever a summoner summons them. These spheres are very similar to mandala in how they are identified with the aeon and how they use symbols and letters to represent them. The relation between the faith and the aeon is similar to how deity yoga works. The meditator is not becoming a god in deity yoga. They're not summoning a god. What manifests is a representation of an element of the universe, often a Buddha who represents an emotion or specific element of reality. This manifestation is a transformation of the praying person's desire that calls upon that divine element of reality. It does not create something from nothing. In the same way, the faith that dreams is manifesting a creature outside of themselves. The faith does not become the aeon. That manifestation can be called and summoned by countless different summoners, because it is not a singular concrete thing, but a representation of an element or aspect of reality. Each aeon, in fact, seems tied to a specific element of existence, based upon the symbols which appear in their chamber and their glyphs. At the back wall of the Chamber of the Faith, there is a unique symbol that represents the Aeon. These are Yevon symbols. Each one represents a letter, but they also represent something else. Of the 24 symbols used to represent the English alphabet, a certain number are also used to represent concepts or elements. The letter A refers to Yevon. The letter Z represents Sin. A to Z, Yevon to Sin seems very close to the Alpha and Omega of Western traditions. It's also similar to Buddhism. The letters and symbols of Buddhism are associated with deities and with elements of creation. Avirahumkam. This is a Tibetan Buddhist mantra, or a phrase used in repetition during prayer and holy rituals. This particular phrase relates to the elements of the universe, because each letter used represents one of the Buddhist elements. Buddhist tradition says there are four, just like Final Fantasy X, though the named elements are different. In Buddhism, it's earth, air, fire, and water. Some traditions also include space as an element of creation. In this particular phrase, the letter A refers to the earth, the first of the great elements. The V refers to water, which is far beyond the path of languages. The letter Ra is fire, purity, freedom from suffering. The letter Hum is wind, which cannot be captured by karmic causation. And the Kam is empty space. All of creation in five words. In Spira, the letter N is fire. The letter F is thunder, the letter L is ice, and the letter W is water, representing the four magical elements. Each of these is heavily associated with the Aeon who uses the element, ice for Shiva, fire for Ifrit, thunder for Ixion. The letter T represents Mu, the Buddhist concept of empty potentiality, which appears as the central symbol for Valfor and Bahamut. You might consider it as a representation of their lack of element. Personally, I interpret the Mu to represent its Buddhist meaning for Bahamut. He is the most Buddhist of the aeons. He carries the wheel of the Dharma on his back, a representation of the Noble Eightfold Path to Enlightenment, and he appears as a messenger, a guide at various points in Titus's journey, leading him down the path to the truth. As for Valifor, I interpret his Mu to refer to the empty space of air, the element, as Valifor is a flying creature, and wind is an important elemental symbol in Buddhism, it is the origin of life, because we all breathe to live, and the energy that flows through our chakra is referred to as the winds in some traditions. If you want to go further, you could interpret Shiva as the Buddhist water element, as ice is merely water transformed, 
Annex Zion could be Earth, because lightning is ultimately grounded in the Earth it strikes. But that's more my personal interpretation than anything. The last letter to have special meaning is B, which represents darkness. It's interesting, it's next to the letter A, which is Yevon, associating the church with shadows, with death. The darkness symbol appears in many unfortunate places. When the curse or death spells are cast, the letter appears, and it is the letter that is associated with anima, the aeon of darkness. The actual language of Yevon, its symbols, is visually based upon a real Buddhist writing, the Saddam script, an old Sanskrit style of writing which was used to transfer many Buddhist texts from their homeland in India to China and further north and east. It was easier to translate Saddam script to Chinese due to various elements of the language, and over time many tantric scriptures were written in the language and then spread across the world. The tantric Buddhist schools, like Shingon and Tendai in Japan, and the Tibetan schools of Nyingma, Gelug, Kagyu, and Sakya, rely heavily on these scriptures, and the language is still used by these traditions today. It's also very popular in video games. You'll see Saddam script used in Devil May Cry as well. The Aeons are created from an energy unique to Spira, the Pyreflies. In Japanese, it's known as Genkochu, using the symbol Gen, meaning illusion or dream, something fleeting, the symbol Hikari for light or shine, and the symbol Mushi for bug or insect. They are spheres of light that represent life. They appear from the departed, they appear from defeated fiends, they can be used to manifest the memories of the living and the appearances of the dead. Their full nature is not described, as the spirins themselves don't fully understand them, but they are clearly a form of energy that seems to underlie the life forms that appear in Spira. They also seem to originate or terminate in the far plane, the location pyreflies go after they receive the sending. In Japan, the far plane is ikai, meaning a strange or different world. And of course, both Japanese symbols have Buddhist meaning. The symbol meaning change is one of the four marks of existence according to some traditions. It's also the shortened form of an unenlightened person, those who have not yet entered nirvana. The word kai, meaning world, is the symbol used to refer to the Buddhist term of datu, or realm, sphere. It refers to the space of existence for a certain element. It implies that this is a realm, a center of being, for the unenlightened dead, those not outside the cycle yet, implying a possible cycle of rebirth in Spira. It also has interesting implications for the summoners and the sending itself. The pyreflies, which might be human souls, or at the very least the energy that remains after death, only enter the far plane if they are at peace with death, or they are sent by a summoner. It requires an act from a holy figure to enter this unenlightened heaven, which resembles the Buddhist concept of the pure land. Not everyone can enter nirvana. It takes a long time, lifetimes of practice and adherence to the Buddhist traditions, and living in the ordinary world as a parent, or an employee, or just an ordinary person who has to participate in society, means it's hard to escape karma. How will these countless normal people ever escape? In the Pure Land tradition, it is through belief in a specific bodhisattva. The bodhisattva, the enlightened person who remains in the cycle of life to save others, manifests a pure land. A place outside the cycle of samsara, where there is no suffering, no reincarnation, no karma. Those who believe in the Bodhisattva will be reborn in their pure land, escaping the cycle. The far plane, in a sense, is a way to help the pyreflies, the dead, escape to a pure land, a place outside the cycle of death Spira is trapped in. There are also those who have managed to escape going to the far plane, the unsent the dead who do not become fiends, because they have enough strength and mental fortitude to remain human. They have bodies and are physical beings in a sense, though they can also become less physical and more ghostly at will. These unsent exist in special strange bodies, which are very similar to the many bodies of the Buddha. Later Buddhist traditions tried to explain how the Buddha, a normal human, might also be a spectral, supernormal person. 
As the central figure to an ever-growing religion, the idea he might be more than human eventually developed into the concept of the kaya, or bodies, of the Buddha. This isn't unique to the original Buddha. Any enlightened Buddha or Bodhisattva has access to these manifestations of existence. There's Dharmakaya, that is, ultimate existence, the all, the mental consciousness that becomes one with reality. Then there's the Nirmanakaya, that's a manifestation, a body that looks real, looks physical, but isn't. This is how the Buddha appears in the world, in people's dreams, as a manifestation before a believer long after he's died. It is a projection of the Buddha from their place in the ultimate, the transcendent. Rupakaya is an actual physical human body that a Buddha has during their human lifetime, and Sambhogakaya is a celestial body, the divine spiritual form that appears after death, which is used in the Pure Land. The unsent of Spira are similar to the Nirmanakaya, physical bodies that appear to have form but are just projections, mental creations manifested by the will of the unsent. To become an unsent, the person must first die, and it is the period after death in which they are potentially transforming into pyreflies to either enter the far plane or become a fiend that the unsent can be born. In Tibetan tradition, this period is known as the bardo, the time in between a person's death but before their rebirth or entry to the next stage of existence. It typically lasts about 49 days, and important rituals have developed wherein the living must remember and make offerings to the dead to ensure they remain at peace. If a person does not receive these offerings, they may become hungry ghosts, or preta, the Buddhist term. These are spirits who are not remembered, who did not receive food and offerings from the living. Unable to pass on, they suffer eternal hunger and are damned to wander forever. This concept goes as far back as India and the original Buddhist traditions. In those days, monks lived off the alms and offerings of food that were given by the townsfolk. In return, one of the duties of the monk was to offer some of the food to the preta, so that they might be purified and sent to the afterlife. In the same way, the unsent and the fiends are the responsibility of the summoner, the only one capable of sending them to the far plane. This idea of having to send the dead to their final resting place doesn't just deal with hungry ghosts. Historically, Buddhism has been used in Japan in a similar fashion to the sending, the recitation of prayer, specifically the homage to Amitabha, which is central to Pure Land Buddhism, began as a way to protect living people from the dead by sending them to the afterlife. Reciting the phrase during mourning would ensure the dead spirit would enter the Pure Land, which we've already established has a lot in common with the far plane. Recitation of prayer is very important in Buddhism, and it's important in Spira too. In fact, every temple has its own unique version of the central prayer, a song that plays in the faith's chambers, which seems to be the faith itself singing. The words of the faith sound Japanese, but they're actually gibberish until you read them a different way. Read vertically from left to right, and Japanese words appear, which can be translated as Pray, Yu Yeven, Dream, Faith, Without End, Please Grant Prosperity. The words tie directly into the religious symbols of the game and the heart of Yevonite faith, a never-ending cycle of prayer and summoning, a prayer for prosperity through dreams, the aeons the faith summon. In Buddhist tradition, such repetitive prayers are called mantra, words and phrases used in ritual and prayer, often repetitively. Mantra can be translated as protection for the mind, words that fortify the mental fortitude of the one praying. It means all holding, holding everything. These are the words that embody reality and manifest mental strength. In some traditions, mantra is understood to be the sound of the universe, the natural hum and vibration in all things. Spirans don't just recite prayer, while they pray, they often bow as well. You can even make Titus do so at times, praying alongside Waka at Kilika Temple and the statue outside Besaid. Such behavior is very similar to the Buddhist prostrations, a tradition that involves humility and respect displayed via physical act. To prostrate oneself involves either bowing, kneeling, or fully lying upon the ground out of respect for a person or religious figure, 
and as an element of prayer while requesting the aid of the divine. In Tibetan tradition, such prostrations can be very intricate, involving kneeling on the ground, placing both hands together, thumbs touching before moving your hand to touch four parts of your body and then bowing. Some traditions involve getting on one knee, others kneeling with your rear on your ankles and fully bowing. Many of the prostrations made in Final Fantasy X resemble a variety of Buddhist ones. Waka performs several prostrations during prayer, and Yuna performs a special greeting involving kneeling and a hand motion when she first greets her fellow summoner, Isaru. The hand motion is one of many present in Final Fantasy X. Most notable is the prayer of Yevon, which involves stepping back with one foot, brushing your hands back before bringing them forward in a spherical shape and bowing. This prayer and variations of it appear constantly throughout the game, as a form of respectful greeting, a way of expressing emotion, and prayer. In Buddhist traditions, hand motions that have specific religious meaning are known as mudra. There are countless such motions used in holy rituals, in prayer, in meditation and yoga, as means of focusing energy. The word mudra can be translated as seal, and the tradition can become very complex. In Tibetan, there are four kinds of mudra. Kama mudra, the action seal, Yana mudra, the wisdom seal, Maha mudra, the great seal, and Samaya mudra, the commitment seal. There are lots of signs or seals in Final Fantasy X, often called glyphs. In particular, there are the sigils and crests, which are used in the Celestial Weapon side quest, obtainable items the player can use to fully unlock characters' powers. In Japanese, they are referred to as in for the crests and hien for the sigils. The symbol in means sign or stamp and it is the exact symbol used in Japanese to refer to Buddhist mudras. The symbol that's added to sigil in Japanese is he, referring to something sacred or holy, making the objects in Japanese the mudras and sacred mudras, the signs that unlock the character's capabilities. The celestial mirror in Japanese is the Shichio no Kagami. Kagami means mirror, an object which has incredibly sacred symbolism in Japanese. In Shinto tradition, one of the three sacred objects of the goddess Amaterasu is a sacred mirror, hung from a tree to dazzle the goddess during an old folktale. This mirror also interacts with a sacred tree. Shichio is a term that refers to the sacred luminaries. In Chinese astrology, the solar system was considered to be the sun, the moon, and the five planets, that at the time were all the ancient people could see. Venus, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. These are the names used to refer to the characters themselves, each assigned a set, which sometimes changes based on the version of the game you're playing. However, the assignments for Yuna and Titus don't change. Yuna is the moon, Titus is the sun. Titus's name in Okinawan even means sun. It's an interesting choice given Japanese tradition. Unlike many global cultures, the god of the moon is a man and the sun is a woman in Shinto tradition. However, the reverse is true in Buddhist traditions, where the usage of sun and moon symbolism is incredibly detailed and even sexual in nature. In Japanese, Yuna's crest symbol is more specific. Her sigil and crest are given the name Getsurin, meaning not just moon, but full moon the spherical shape tying into the overall theme of spheres and spirals. Titus's symbol is Nichiren, a word that means sun, but it's also a name, the name of a Buddhist monk who founded his own tradition of Buddhism in Japan centuries ago. The symbols of the sun and moon often appear in Buddhist scripture. In the Paramatyotika, the Buddha is like the moon, the Dharma taught by him the shedding of the moon's effulgence. The Buddha is like the rising sun, the Dharma already stated like the web of his rays. The two are often posed together, for they have important symbolic meaning to the more esoteric Buddhist traditions. In every mandala there appears a sun and a moon, the seats upon which the Buddha or Bodhisattva rests. This is because the sun and moon represent the foundation upon which every Buddha exists, the traits they must have in order to become bodhisattva. The sun represents the concept of wisdom, the moon represents the concept of compassion. 
the two elements every bodhisattva must have in order to be enlightened. In Tibetan scripture, wisdom and compassion are the sun and moon, and are often represented as male and female figures, and the union of the two as a literal physical union in the bliss of intercourse. You cannot have a bodhisattva without both the sun and moon. Yuna is compassion, the moon from the start, but she does not begin developing wisdom, the sun, until she meets Titus. She never questions his coming from Xanarkand or his strange behavior. She listens to him. She learns from him. Ultimately, she becomes one with him. Together they discover the truth. They learn how to save everyone from sin. Wisdom and compassion coming together to enlightenment. Of course, this means Titus is ultimately the one who disappears. The story begins with Yuna's selfless desire to die to save all, and the suffering the desire actually causes. Once she realizes her death won't end the cycle, she doesn't take the easy path. She goes against tradition and seeks a new way. There's no reason to die if it serves no one. But if it does save everyone, if it will end suffering, Titus decides he is willing to disappear. The switch, the change from one character to another, shows it's not wrong to be willing to give yourself up to help others, if it will really help. But the desire to live is not itself selfish either. The game takes the middle path between two extremes, as Buddhism always does. The dream ends, as all dreams must. For all life is a dream that we will one day wake from. But the end of a dream is also the beginning of a dream. Because existence is a constant flow, a coming and going. Someday the dream must end. And then it will begin again.